Good morning. My name's Mary Connor. I'm a consultant gynaecologist and I work in Sheffield in the United Kingdom. And I want to talk to you about the role of office hysteroscopy in infertility management. Um, the photograph, by the way, is of the hospital where I work, um, the Jessup Wing, where I was based with uh, Prof Lee when he was in the UK last, uh, is behind the Sheffield Hallam, uh, Royal Hallamshire Hospital. And these are the, some of the surrounding areas. So welcome from Sheffield. What I want to discuss in these next 20 minutes is the venue where we perform hysteroscopy and where the sort of environment that you need to offer, the hysteroscopy team, patient preparation, hysteroscopy technique, analgesia and anesthesia and office operative procedures. And we'll touch on some of those. There are three main areas that I want to focus on, three separate areas that you need really to have available if you're going to provide a hysteroscopy service, an outpatient one. You've got the waiting area, you've got the hysteroscopy room itself, and then you've got the recovery area. And it's important to note that your waiting area and your recovery area are separate. You want people to be able to wait comfortably, um, unperturbed, unrushed, and you want those recovering from the hysteroscopy, which hasn't necessarily been a major trauma for them at all, but some of them might feel a little faint, some might feel a little bit sick. You want them to give them privacy. You want to give them somewhere that they can calmly recover and then leave from there. So the hysteroscopy room itself, there are some key elements within this. You need a couch for your patient. You want her to be able to be comfortable. You want her to be um, able to relax as much as possible. You need flexibility about her position. You need to be able to lie flat in case she has a vasovagal reaction and you need to be able to do that promptly. You need a chair for, to sit on as the hysteroscopist. You need a camera and a stack system where you've got the light source, you've got recording equipment, and of course you monitor. <clears throat> and just from an ergonomic point of view, you want to be able to have that monitor at a comfortable level so that can, that can come down. You want to be able to sit there, maintain that position comfortably and be able to perform these procedures for quite some time during a day or, or, a, or even several days per week. You've got here, uh, some instruments um, that we would use for uh, operative procedures. And then you've got preparation areas as well. You need somewhere where you can sit and talk to the patient about what's going to happen so you can talk them through beforehand, make sure that they're aware of what it is that you're going to be doing and what they are consenting to. So you need somewhere that they can get changed, uh, somewhere that they can get changed in private, um, ideally a place with a, a, a toilet and a wash hand basin so that they can uh, undress in comfort. Um, how much they need to undress varies, but we try and ask them to, un to undress as little as possible. Um, I often wear scrubs because hysteroscopy is a bit of a wet procedure at times. Um, and I, do, I feel it's more appropriate than wearing my um, sort of office clothes, but the patient doesn't need to fully undress. We just ask them to take the lower clothing off and we give them a sheet to wrap around them. Not a beautiful sheet, but it's something that gives a little bit more privacy while they walk from the changing room um, and sit on the couch. The recovery room has two reclining chairs as well as um, a bed that can, we can make flat. We rarely need to use this, but we feel more comfortable having it available for the very few occasions that we need uh, patients to lie flat. Um, and we have also the facility, because this is in the outpatient clinic, this is in a hospital environment, we can admit patients to the ward, but again, we rarely need to do that. But it's having that flexibility, that facility, that confidence that we can, uh, in a streamlined way, take people people from uh, the hysteroscopy suite across to the ward if we need to. Now, as far as the team is concerned, um, there are at least four members of the team, two of the uh, trained nursing staff, as well as a support worker and the, the, the clinician. Um, you need somebody who's going to be with the patient throughout the procedure as their support, watching out for them, um, encouraging them, making sure that uh, they, the advocate for the patient and also for the occasional time where the patient's finding it too distressing and we need to stop. As the hysteroscopist, you are trying to be vigilant too to this, but it may be that you need somebody else to say, 
I think I think she's had enough. We need to stop. The patient may be saying, no, no, carry on, carry on, particularly some of our fertility patients, because they are really quite desperate to have their hysteroscopy performed. If they've got a polyp uh, and that's going to be offered to be removed, they want that done, even if it's not the right venue for them. Um, so we need to be prepared as a clinician to stop as well, even if the patient um, seemingly or verbalizes that that's what they want and when in fact that's not the appropriate thing to do. So being prepared to stop is key to a successful um, process. The patient needs to come prepared and by that I mean they need to be aware of what it is that you're going to be undertaking. So they need written information, they may want to watch some videos about what the procedure entails. Um, the information sheet produced by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists a couple of years ago includes some uh, images which show what hysteroscopy is, it shows what may be found inside the womb. One of the key things I want to emphasise here is we always perform pregnancy tests on all the women we see who are under 55 years of age and the fertility patients are no exception. Um, and the other thing that we emphasise is the need to use contraception. It's important they don't have unprotected intercourse prior to, um, well, from the onset of the previous period to the time of the hysteroscopy. So that may be a week, it may be two weeks, it may be nearly four weeks, because that pregnancy test will not be positive until around four weeks have passed since the LMP, if they had conceived that cycle. So it's important that we don't disturb the environment inappropriately. Um, and that may seem a strange thing to the fertility patients that they're being asked to use contraception, but that needs explaining and clarifying. The key to a good office hysteroscopy is making the procedure as comfortable for the patient as possible. One of the ways of achieving that is using small diagnostic hysteroscopes of less than four millimeters. And this is the outer diameter of the sheath, not just the size of the hysteroscope, but the size of the sheath that you're going to be using. A number of these are available. If you need to move on to an office procedure, then you will be using a slightly bigger telescope, um, but that's um we'll, we'll discuss that shortly and i use a vaginoscopic approach and by that i mean we are going in without a speculum looking for the cervix uh, much more comfortable for the patient for a speculum not to be present i don't put a tenaculum on the cervix it's important that you disturb the vaginal area as little as possible really and i'll show you what i mean by a vaginoscopic approach shortly Keeping the distension fluid uh, pressure low, we just use saline. We have it attached to um, a fluid bag, a litre fluid bag with a giving set attached to your hysteroscope with a little bit of pressure, but we keep this as low as possible. Sometimes if there's a lot of blood in the cavity, you may need to increase the pressure, um, but start with as low as possible so that the patient doesn't have a rude awakening as you insert the hysteroscope into the lower cervix, because that pressure is transmitted as soon as you've past the external loss um, and not just as you go into the cavity itself. We normally use a as a diagnostic scope, a 30 degree one. So you need to keep the survival canal um, at the six o'clock position. Um, so this is a diagram just illustrating that. So this will be the dark view that you see of the, the cervical loss as you go through. Um, this is the direction of your travel as you want to be going through the os. You don't want to be going um, into the wall of the cervix. If you had that with a 30 degree scope, if you had that black circle in the middle, then you would find yourself going down into the um, cervical wall and you don't want to be doing that's painful, that's not pleasant. And it doesn't achieve what you want either. It doesn't get you into the cavity. So remember this as you proceed. So this is a, a short video. This is important to note this is an unedited video. I didn't need to edit it in order to demonstrate the one. This is a postmenopausal patient. You may be, this is the vagina, you can see some atrophic change. So this is a posterior fornix. Then that's one of your landmarks. Find the posterior fornix, then look up at around 12 o'clock and we can see here the cervix, there's the os. Uh, there's mucus coming out with um, strands helping to direct you where to go. So if you follow that mucus, you, you need to sort of to work out your, your landmarks, the recognisable features that help you. Now, I'm not ploughing straight through, but I'm just gently allowing the fluid to open up, a little bit of pressure on the uh, hysteroscope, and this will sort of open the way. 
I often will come back a little bit to re reassess the situation. Um, if I feel I'm not sure where I'm going, but again, aiming to keep that OS at six o'clock. So it's not just a simple, because um, it's low pressure, it's not just opening up the channel, but it does give a much more comfortable view that we can see the OS coming up, internal OS, and now we're in the cavity. So that's gone in um, fairly simply. And if I can show you that, it doesn't give you the time, but we're talking about a matter of seconds. I'm looking inside the cavity by rotating the hysteroscope, looking at the thunders. Here we are seeing a polyp, looked at my landmarks, both tubal ostia. There's the big polyp. So one of the studies that has helped us understand about the value of using vaginoscopy and its safety, because people have worried about whether this is going to introduce infection into the uterus. This study was published um, La, uh, two years ago, 2019, and it's the vast study looking at vaginoscopy against standard treatment, and it was a randomized controlled trial. This is a busy slide, but no real apologies because it gives us the information in one place, and we'll go through this. So we can see that there were nearly 800 people in both arms of the trial, and they were equally successful. That was um, a little... Uh, not hugely different, but uh, 89, 85 with a p-value of 0 0.01. Um, the procedure failures, there are differences here in that the cervical stenosis was the primary reason for the vaginoscopy failing, but only 4%. Uh, it was overcome in the with the standard technique, uh, but there was a lot more pain in the standard technique compared with vaginoscopy. Total failures, um, were not hugely different. Acceptability um, was very similar. Complications was rather more in the standard technique than in the vaginoscopy. Infection, this is an important one here. Um, there was a little bit more problems with urinary tract infections, but no problems with dis discharge. And overall, the infection rate, again, were very similar. So total complications was in favour of the vaginoscopy approach. The uh, procedure failures was in favour of the uh, vaginoscopy approach again, um, as was the uh, successful procedures. So there was no great risk of infection. I think that's the important thing to emphasise and it's acceptable to patients. The technique once you're inside the uterus, um, with the 30 degree scope, we use this for a reason because it gives us a good view of the uterine cavity without having to move the hysteroscope very much. So it's important that you rotate, learn to rotate the hysteroscope um, around the camera, around your light, using a light guide cable so that you can um, get the best view without having to swing from side to side and cause discomfort for the patient. And you want to avoid touching the uterine walls because that's where um, they can be more sensitive, particularly at the thunders. So this is the sort of view that you'll see um, of the tubal ostia on one side as you rotate the um, hysteroscope. And then another example of this, another video, just to show you going through the cervical canal. Um, again, this is unedited because it does not take long to undertake these procedures uh, and it gives you an adequate view. So again, beautiful views of the cervix as you go through. Um, you're watching, looking out for, depending on where possible polyps within the cervical canal. Coming into the uterine cavity, again, altering the position of the scope so that you can adapt to the curve in the canal and any tortuousness. And once you're in, you're looking for your landmarks, you're looking to uh, inspect all of the uh, uterine cavity. You've got tubal ostia, so you know your landmarks, you know you're there. You do have to be careful you don't go into the bladder, which is very easy to do uh, occasionally. So you have to watch that where you insert, how you insert the um, hysteroscope in the vaginal entrance and make sure you don't go into the bladder. And that may be why they got a few more urinary tract infections in vaginoscopy approach compared with the standard approach. So we can see a few, few little polyps in this particular lady's uterine cavity. Now, in terms of analgesia and anesthesia, this is clearly something that we need to attend to. And we'll look at oral an analgesics, local anesthetics. We use some inhaled analgesics as well, and then non-pharmacological aids. 
recent study published only last year looked at oral analgesia. I won't go you through the whole study, but the conclusion was that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories appear effective. In fact, all the different groups of analgesia that they looked at were effective. There was non-steroidals, there was opioids, uh, there was um, antispasmodics, as well as the TENS machines, the, um, the nerve stimulating device. Um, the reason that they put forward that non-steroidals should be used is because of the lack of, um, uh, uh, well, for women who, for whom it's not contraindicated, but you didn't have the side effects with that you got with the opioids and the antispasmodics. So they would suggest that the TENS is a, a realistic alternative. Now, I must admit it's not something I've used, but it was interesting that they investigated this particular way. And it's something that could be integrated into your care if you feel that um, non steroidals are impossible. We use paracetamol a lot as well, but they didn't look at whether paracetamol alone is sufficient. This is the uh, adverse effects. And we can see here that even though we know the, um, the buscopan and uh, tramadol are effective, they do result in a lot more side effects. So for routine use, um, this favors the non-steroidals uh, and particularly we use ibuprofen and paracetamol. My trust and pharmacy advocate that we don't use diclofenic on a regular basis. You're looking after patients with fertility problems, so diclofenic may be appropriate for you to use because they're a younger age group, they're slightly to have renal failure problems. Um, but you do have to be careful about diclofenic in that context. TENS machines, certainly there's some um, work looking at this. Um, but again, it's what's readily available. And I have enough difficulty encouraging patients to remember to take any pain relief, never mind um, using a TENS machine. Um, so I think one has to be practical and pragmatic about this um, and be able to offer patients some simple analgesia as well. Um, we use co codeine at times as well, which hasn't been explored here. Um, but if they can't tolerate um, the ibuprofen, but they know that they can tolerate codeine well, and not everybody can, then codeine and paracetamol may be a better combination. But we offer them something if they haven't taken any, because often they come anxious, they're worried before they came. Um, and it's there's certainly plenty of evidence that anxiety before hysteroscopy is a real issue. So uh, we will remind them when they've arrived and offer them some medication if that's appropriate. Now, local anaesthetics. We don't routinely use the small hysteroscopes and by small, I mean less than four millimeters or four millimeters or less. Um, I would offer patients, make patients aware that anesthetics available and as well, give them a choice. One of the problems of giving local anesthetics it can be painful, not just because of the needle you're putting in the, in the cervix and the tissue, but because of the local anesthetic itself. Um, in the way that it's prepared can be quite, it can be quite acidic and it can be really quite painful. Um, I certainly would, when I do need to use a tenaculum and I often only use a tenaculum because I'm giving the local anesthetic and I want to steady the cervix and make sure I get my needle and syringe in and we use a dental needle and syringe. I want to get that needle in as deep as possible and without bending it. So I need to take it in carefully and using a tenaculum on the cervix is helpful. Now the little bleb of local anaesthetic onto the anterior lip of the cervix works very quickly, whichever local anaesthetic you use, but the deeper a local anaesthetic takes a bit longer. So as far as which local anaesthetic to use is concerned, um, I would strongly advocate that you don't use um, a vasoconstrictor such as adrenaline. Uh, if you do feel it's necessary to use one and the evidence isn't there that it's helpful or not, then use a very um, selective one such as felipressin found in cytoness with octopressin. Otherwise, the adrenaline is readily absorbed and gives quite marked side effects with muscle tremor and tachycardia and an already anxious patient feels significantly more anxious. And I don't think there's, there's, there isn't any evidence to show that it's beneficial. There isn't any evidence to show that it, it's harmful other than the side effects. So stick to a local anesthetic. I tend to use mepivacaine because it's slightly longer uh, lasting, but it is also a little longer, takes a little longer to become effective. And you need to allow that time for it to become effective. We have a, um, a, a, a timer that tells us when three minutes is up. And we talk to the patients before we give the local anaesthetic and let them know that we will have 
downtime of three minutes where I take the speculum out, take the tenaculum off the cervix, because I can then proceed with my vaginoscopic approach, even when I'm using a treatment size five millimeter hysteroscope. So I wouldn't routinely use it for a diagnostic procedure, but I would routinely use it for treatment. Where am I going to put the local anaesthetic? Well, there are various options. I uh, There is evidence that paracervical injections are effective, but I tend to use uh, intracervical, so 12 o'clock bleb, uh, and there's again evidence that this is useful, um, six o'clock, three o'clock, and nine o'clock. So four positions, uh, and I start my timer when I finish putting my two ampoules of local anaesthetic divided between those four places. Um, there is a little evidence that topical surface application can be helpful, um, but the evidence for that is weak as it is for intrauterine installation. We tend to use the fundal or corneal blocker it's used for endometrial ablations, which is outside the area we want to be considering for fertility patients. You need a protocol for the type of analgesia where you're working, you need a maximum dosage, you need to know how you're going to be giving it and you need to watch for side effects due to systemic absorption. And as I mentioned, there is good evidence that both intracervical and paracervical is, um, local anaesthetic is beneficial, particularly if you're going to be dilating the cervix or putting it in a slightly wider um, uh, hysteroscope. But you need to be, um, you need to be mindful of what the patient wants as well. Um, and you need to be um, supportive of them and give them part, make them part of that choice as well. Now, we support the patients with inhaled nitrous oxide, Entonox. The evidence for using it is relatively low because it's not been studied. So it's lack of evidence rather than evidence that it's not effective. We know that it's used a lot on labor wards. It's used for, um, on, uh, for endoscopies, for colonoscopies, for gastroscopies, used in any departments when they're sewing somebody up uh, with a cut. Um, I find it particularly useful with anxious patients because it helps relax them. It's an anti-anxiolytic. It's also helpful um, with some form of pain relief, particularly when I'm putting the local anaesthetic in. When we have our dying time of three minutes, obviously they can stop. And you need to have given them in a few minutes for it to work as well. Um, and then they may not restart it because you've got your local anaesthetic in, you've got given it time to be effective and that might tide them through. But the other sort of pain that they can get besides the cervical pain is the stretching pain. Now you're aiming to minimize that, but nonetheless, if you need to see what you're doing, particularly with an operative procedure, you might need to uh, increase the intrauterine pressure a little and that might give them crampy pain. And some of the women just get crampy pain anyway, or however low your pressure. So that is again, something helpful to see them through the procedure. Afterwards, we need to think about afterwards as well. Um, women can get crampy pain. And again, the study that was done with the oral analgesia so that the, all of those four groups of uh, different types of analgesia were effective with crampy pains afterwards. Um, you may have stopped the procedure, but the uterus can still contract. And we find um, that heat pads are particularly useful. And we have a box of boxes of these available so that we can give the patient something that's going to last for 12 hours. There's also work looking at other distraction methods during the hysteroscopy. I mentioned anxiety is a real important problem and we need to be able to, sometimes, sometimes people come with their own music, we let them listen to that. Um, there are there's work going on at looking at headsets with videos and other distraction methods and they do seem to have some effect but that does mean you then have a little bit more difficulty of eye contact and, and communication with the patient where you need to make sure that you know they're able to talk to you you're able to talk to them you perhaps they may wish to know what's happening they may wish to know what you're finding so I find that communication would be a barrier but work needs to be done on this now as far as operative procedures concerned um, I wanted to talk about the um, hysteroscopic tissue morselators because these can be readily integrated into your office um, diagnostic procedure as a sort of see and treat preparation and this is particularly appreciated by our fertility patients who are often waiting for this hysteroscopy um, before they can proceed with further fertility treatment. So not having to wait for a diagnostic then having to wait for an operative procedure to follow is 
very much welcomed. So there are three devices that are around. The first of them that was developed was the True Clear uh, tissue removal system by Hart, Mark Hans Manuel in the Netherlands. Um, and this consists of a device that goes down the True Clear hysteroscope, which is um, five millimeters in diameter without the outflow on it. And that's how it, I often use it. There are two types of blades that are used. There's the reciprocating blade, but the more commonly used um, rotating blade, which reaches the fundus very well. This one used for soft tissue, the, the, uh, uh, and then the reciprocating blade for fibroids. Uh, they come in two sizes. There are two sizes of hysteroscopes. So the smaller five millimeter one uh, and a larger 7.25 uh, elite. The Myershaw system came in afterwards. Uh, again, with different size hysteroscopes and a variety of blades, depending upon the type of tissue that you want to remove. And then the Bugatti system. Uh, and the novel thing about the Bugatti system is that these blades are reusable. These ones for my sure and true clear are single use, but the Bugatti ones you can reuse. They all have this offset eyepiece because the uh, morselating device goes down the central pole of your hysteroscope. So you need your eyepiece out of the way, but they work well. There's good evidence that they're well tolerated by patients. And um, I used to use the VersaPoint electrodes in outpatients, but we took part in a trial with TrueClear versus VersaPoint. And we know that this, the TrueClear was more effective and far less painful. Um, they all work by nibbling the tissue and sucking it out. So one of the reasons for calling it a TrueClear system is because you can see what you're doing the whole time. So this is using Maya Shaw to remove a, a submucosal fibroid that's in the cavity. Um, and this, this video here is looking at removing a polyp. Now, um, this uh, Maya Shaw is using an, a, a, um, a premenopausal patient. The polyp is being removed in a postmenopausal patient. But these were both done as see and treat procedures. So the woman arrived, we explained what was going to be happening. They had information about what would be happening before they came to us. Um, and then we were able to perform the polypectomy or the fibroid resection at the same time. So all of that fibroid can be removed. Now, these systems are good for the type zero fibroids, the ones which are completely in the cavity. It, you can't remove the deeper um, myometrial portion. Um, you can winkle out a very superficial um, myometrial portion, particularly with the TrueClear system, um, less so with the Myershaw system. Um, but polyps, very effective for, because those are endometrial, then there's no depth to them. They're very superficial in the cavity. The companies have upgraded their slides and Medtronic have introduced the Elite Scopes, which are modifications of the standard 5C hysteroscope, um, as well as their um, True Clear 8, which was um, up to nine millimeters in diameter. They've introduced the 7.25 scope, so somewhat narrower for their um, larger blades for removal of um, greater amounts of tissue, either soft tissue or fibroids. Um, they've introduced the six millimeter scope, the Elite 6, which may can be used for the smaller fibroids in the outpatient setting. Um, slightly greater diameter than the 5C, which is useful for polyps. Um, but they're offering different things with extremely good views because these ones are using rod lenses. Um, Medtronic have introduced the Omni hysteroscope set, which is extremely useful because it has um, a very narrow hysteroscope with a 3.7 millimeter sheath that enables you to perform a diagnostic procedure. And using the same telescope, you can then proceed on to a different size uh, sheath, which is 5.6 millimeters for operative procedures. So if the patient doesn't have a polyp when you've, and you've established this by looking inside the uterus, you've only used that 3.7 millimeter sheath, that less than four millimeters. Um, they also have the six millimeter sheath where you can use the chunkier XL blade for the larger fibroid removal. So you're looking at um, perhaps looking at three millimeters, but often that six millimeters can be used in the outpatient setting as well. Um, and then the other thing that Ologic have introduced is a manual um, device for removing tissue and the advantage of this is that it's hand controlled so no additional um, machinery required. Um, the ro device rotates by pressing this handset and it also sucks the tissue into the little tissue trap at the end. So 
uh, for the smaller polyps, because it's quite hard work to use and to remove the tissue, smaller polyps, 15 millimeters diameter or less, uh, it's quite useful for um, using, trying to expand your see and treat service. So if you don't uh, want to bring the patient back for a larger polyp removal, then this is something that will be very effective. So um, to summarise, office hysteroscopy is certainly feasible and it's well accepted by patients. Um, but the patient does need to be well prepared in advance with written information, perhaps the videos. The patient must be the focus of your attention. You must provide them with individual support. So you do need somebody who is there, literally holding their hand if that's what they wish, and also being the advocate so that you know that if the patient's becoming distressed and you need to stop, that you can do so and the patient can be confident that they're in control. You need to be able to provide careful and gentle hysteroscopy. This is the um, really key to providing a good hysteroscopy service. Operative procedures are certainly feasible and very straightforward to include in your uh, see and treat or diagnostic service, particularly for the small endometrial polyps um, and small submucosal fibroids. The fibroids are dense, so they take longer to remove. And you need to be able to complete the procedure within 15 minutes. If it's not complete, you may need to bring the patient back again for a second procedure. But certainly office hysteroscopy is well suited to fertility patients who you want to investigate prior to fertility treatment or when they've had unsuccessful treatment and removal of polyps is possible, removal of submucosal fibroids. Another question is whether these are necessary, but that's a question for another study that um, is going to be undertaken in the near future. So I hope you find that helpful and I hope you find that will help in your um, care of fertility patients. Thank you.